Welcome to another edition of the Giants Little Podcast, brought to you by Citizens, the official bank of the New York Giants. I am John Schmelk, joined as always on Tuesdays by the one and only Sean O'Hara. He's manning the fort back there in East Rutherford. I know everyone's excited to get a peek inside my hotel room here in Tempe in the early morning hours on Pacific time. Mr. O'Hara. Yeah, did you leave the light on for no, us? <laughs> I'm, afraid, I'm, af- I'm afraid if I open up the curtains and the sun comes in, I'm going to be even darker. So we are doing yeah. our best here with the... Yeah. With, I hope you put that do not disturb sign on the outside door. I don't want anybody bothering you during your work space right now, but thank you for leaving your swipe card so I could get into the building, get into your office today. I think we can call this bi-coastal right now, right? We've got both East Coast and West Coast covered right now. Yeah, absolutely. We we are covering both coasts, both uh, sides of kind of where the Giants are hanging out. So you've had a couple days to to kind of sit on what the Giants did on Sunday against Arizona, Sean. Uh, I think, both of us probably didn't feel great at halftime. Felt a lot greater after the game. Uh, yeah. your, your your kind of thoughts two days later. Yeah, well, listen, we're a lot more jovial right now than we thought we were going to be at halftime of that game. Um, I think it was just an epic comeback. You know, I not to be dramatic, John, but I, I feel like, and it's week two, I get it, but that win, that come from behind win in the second half saved the season. Like, just think about it. If they don't win that game, they're 0-2 on a short week going to San Francisco 49ers on Thursday Night Football. They're staring 0-3 in the face, right? Like, we talked all season long before it started about three games in 11 days. If the Giants ended up going 0-3, like, man, I tell you what, the sky would have been falling around here. So, it, it I think it was a, a season-saving win. It felt a lot like the week one win at Tennessee last year. And it was like just, wow, like, the confidence, the ability to, hey, we're going for it. We're being aggressive. Um, so I, I think I don't think that can be understated. The performance of Daniel Jones cannot be understated. He did something epic, something historic. No other quarterback in the history of the NFL has thrown for 250 yards, rushed for 50 yards, thrown two passing touchdowns, rushed for a touchdown, and had zero turnovers in a half. Nobody's ever done that before. The last person to do it in a game was Michael Vick back in 2000. So um, epic performance by him and – I think when you just look at the way that the defense responded to once the offense started playing, they had a couple of great uh, stops forcing Arizona to punt and to get off the field. Um, and and then, you know, really just to touch on the offensive line. I don't, I don't know if a lot of people were aware, but the Giants basically started three, maybe even four. You can call them four rookies almost at offensive line on the road in Arizona. So Andrew Thomas was out. As Josh Azudu makes his very first start at left tackle. Um, he had started a couple games last year at guard. Uh, of course, John Michael Schmitz at center is playing his second NFL game at left guard. You had Ben Bredersen, who has started a bunch of games, but he's a younger player. Right guard, Marcus McKeithen, making his very first NFL start. He tore his ACL last year and missed all the entire season, basically. Um, and then, of course, Evan Neal, at right tackle, who uh, is in his second year. And, um, you know, when you look at that offensive line, the way that they kind of settled down in the second half, um, I, I think that is something that cannot be overstated, overlooked or understated the performance of that group in the second half. Yeah. Now, Sean, this is kind of usually we do the look back on Tuesdays, but since it's a Thursday game, we're kind of going to make it a hybrid show here. So yeah. let's start to bridge. So let's start here. They cannot afford to have another half of football, let alone, I mean, probably a quarter of football like they did against Arizona against San Francisco. So how do you kind of package what you did in the second half there and just make sure you get off to a faster start? Because if you do what you did against Arizona, against San Francisco, even for a quarter, you're not winning that game. No, no doubt about it. And let's be honest, the 49ers have put 30 points up in each of their two games this year. And against the Pittsburgh Steelers in week one, they were the West Coast team flying East Coast. And I think they were up 20 to nothing, you know, before you knew it. Um, so they have been a fast starting team. You can't afford to do that. I have always felt, John, that Thursday night football, because it is a short week, I've always felt like a, both teams start slow. Like it always ends up being just a punt fest to start the game because everybody's just still kind of recovering from the previous game. Nobody wants to, to make that mistake early on. So I feel like both teams end up being very conservative to start the game offensively because they don't want to make a big mistake. They don't want to put their quarterback in, in, a, in a predicament where they're creating some sort of turnover. So I think that sense of urgency, now the Giants, you know, look, when you go from the preseason to the regular season, it's a different speed. It's a different intensity. I think the Giants felt that against Dallas, but just could never get back into the game. Now they understand here's how intense and how hard we have to play in order to give ourselves a chance. Um, I think when you're on the road, that first drive is paramount. You cannot go three and out. 
You can't just give the you know, give the ball right back to them. So um, obviously, no Saquon Barkley. That's going to be a, a big key. When defenses look at the Giants right now, the one guy that everybody's game planning for is Saquon. How do we slow him down? How do we take him out of the game? Don't let him beat us. Without him in the offense and in the lineup, that might change a little bit about the way teams try to defend the Giants. Now maybe you say, look, we're going to not let Daniel Jones um, you know, beat us with his legs. Or you know, maybe now we focus on Darren Waller. So I'll be curious to see how the 49ers – try to take somebody away and who they decide to take away uh, for the Giants. But you have to start fast. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, not no turnovers on the road is always a great recipe for success. And how about defensively, John? The defense has yet to have a turnover. Jason Pinnock. Or had sack. Interception, um, you know, that was called back as a penalty, but we don't have a single interception or a single forced fumble this season. I think we're the only team in the NFL that have that. So you've got to create some turnovers, find a way to get that ball back, get some extra possessions for the offense. You're ready for a change. Payday comes early with citizens. So go to that retreat. New you moves to the country. Now you're raising goats and launching a lifestyle brand. Are you ready for all that life brings? And, and no sacks either, Sean. I mean, you, you put those three things yeah. together. It, it's hard for a defense to make an impact when you're not making those big plays. Yeah, I mean, that's huge. And and I think when you look at last year, what, who the Giants were defensively, we were the number one blitzing defense in the league. We brought more pressure and blitzes than anybody. This year, we kind of scaled back from that. And so you can kind of say maybe that has had an impact with two rookie corners. I don't blame Week Martindale for not wanting to call all these blitzes and put those guys on an island. But to be honest, Deontay Banks has been even better than I think anybody could have expected. Um, he has been basically leave him out there, let him do his thing, and you almost don't even know he's there. He's just, you know, he's that good. He's that physical. Um, he he's he fits the bill. But pass rush from the front four, like where is it? Let's go. Kayvon Thibodeau is really struggling to get off blocks. Like I have not seen him on the edge of a tackle this season. Like he's not – the get off needs to be better. Um, he needs to get after it. Now he's going up against Trent Williams, who is the best left tackle in the league. So to all of a sudden think Kayvon Thibodeau is going to have his breakout game this week against Trent Williams, that might be a little far fetched, but they've got to create some pressures. Um, you know, they've got to find a way on the other side. Obviously, Ojalari didn't play in the Arizona game. So hopefully you get him back, but either he or Zimenez. Um, or maybe maybe you put Isaiah Simmons in there on third down and try to get some speed off the edge because you can't let Brock Purdy sit in the pocket and uh, you know have time. So that's definitely key, um, getting some pressure on the quarterback. But really, when you face this 49ers offense, you have to stop the run. And I'm not just talking about Christian McCaffrey, who has been electric between the tackles. This is not the Christian McCaffrey we saw in Carolina, like screen passes, get him outside. No, he is pounding the Brock running through people, breaking tackles. So it's not just him. Like it's Debo Samuel, who just had another rushing touchdown last week. Um, you know, Brandon Ayuk, if he's playing, he's tough to tackle. And George Kittle, rarely does he ever go down when the first guy gets to him defensively. So uh, a big challenge, a big task ahead of the Giants defense. Yeah, and look, they have moved Kayvon Thibodeau around a little bit. Last week against the Cardinals, they actually had him over the rookie right tackle, Paris uh, Campbell, a bunch in that game. So I think that that's something else you can kind of, you know, keep an eye on if they try to move him around around Trent Williams. And it's funny. I just looked up that to made the point. The Giants have backed off their blitzes a little bit. But for Wink, that just means he's now the third highest blitz rate in the league, not the highest. They're at about 47 percent there. He's always first. He's third now. Yeah. Which well, is and probably, John, a lot of that's probably just because the Dallas game got out of hand and it was like, you know, what, I'm, I'm not, there's no point in blitzing. We're down 30 to nothing. Like, let's just, you know, let's not give up any big plays. Yeah. And so what happened with the run defense against the Cardinals? Because that has to get better too. James Conner was breaking tackles left and right. I mean, that to yeah. me is just fundamentals, right? Of just, you, you have to bring these guys down on first contact. I think it's twofold. Number one, James Conner, like what in the world did he eat? Like, give, <laughs> give me some of that. I think he was eating some ostrich eggs, uh, you know, with Dan Campbell uh, for, for his pregame meal. I, I, I don't know what you can do defensively. You have guys there ready to make the tackle, and he's running through everybody. I mean, he ran over Xavier McKinney. Um, he, he ran through a couple different guys on a couple different plays. So that guy's a little bit of a, a beast, and, and he went beast mode. But I think for 
a, a lot of the defenders, I call it sloppy September. The tackling is, this is always the worst tackling of the season, the first two to three weeks of the, of the year, because everybody's kind of getting back into that. Some of them didn't play in the preseason um, or you didn't get as many reps on that. But I think number one, you got to run through the tackles. Like the arm tackles are not going to bring Christian McCaffrey down or Debo Samuel or George Kittle. So swarm to the ball, no doubt about it. Um, and I think the one thing too is, Look, the Giants have been playing a lot of nickel. Like they're they're not in base defense a lot. Right. So your your linebackers are Okereke and Micah McFadden. They're not big guys. They're not you wouldn't look at them and say those are run stuffing linebackers. They they are they are fast, they're athletic. Um look, they can get feisty and they they can get off blocks, but you know, if I'm an offensive lineman and I come up and I see the Giants are in nickel, I'm begging our offensive coordinator to run the football. So um, it's really on the safeties rotating down to come in and make those tackles. Um, and, and I think that's really kind of what we've seen, um, you know, against, certainly against Arizona where the struggles were. And, you know, this is not the week you want a short week if you're the Giants defense. You're going up against Kyle Shanahan, and that guy, as much as anyone, Sean, knows how to take his system – but then specify it and really do different things week to week based on the opponent. I'm sure he looked at this Giants defense from last year, you know, over the summer. I'm sure the Giants have done the same, obviously, with his offense. But this is not the week where you have sh uh, a short week, two days to kind of get your players ready for that offense. We know Shanahan is probably the best offensive coordinator and play caller in football. He is so good, John. I agree with you. He's so good at layering different formations and personnel. And he will bring up a formation and it'll start out tight end to the right, receiver to the right, running back to the right. And then all of a sudden receiver goes in motion. Then they bring the tight end back over to the left. And now they have completely changed the formation. Now the strength is to the left and they do a lot that a lot. So you will see the Giants adjusting to that. Actually, the Giants did it a lot in Arizona. Then you would see Okereke and McFadden switching when they did that because they want McFadden to be the will linebacker. They want Okereke to be the Mike. So there's a lot of pre-snap recognition, a lot of pre-snap calls. They do that because they want to try to confuse the defense, get them misaligned. Maybe somebody doesn't adjust and now all of a sudden you've got a huge gap and you, or somebody loses their gap integrity. So a lot of that is, you know, it's premeditated and it's a big part of their package, how they try to attack different defenses. They will try to get you to set the front based on the formation they come out to the line originally to, and then they will attack it. If you don't move the front, they will rotate the tight end to the other side and try to attack the other side of the defense. So there's a lot of chess uh, matches going on out there. Um, I think for the Giants, the other key with that is they do that because now all of a sudden, hey, if the linebacker had the tight end over here, and now when he shifts over here, now the safety has to pick him up. They're banking on at some point there's going to be a miscommunication. We're going to have a guy running free in coverage because they didn't communicate um, or somebody didn't get the right call. So there's a lot of that. And I think to couple with that, they do such a great job of blocking on the move. George Kittle might be one of the best blocking tight ends on the move. Um, and, of course, uh, use check, their, their fullback. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I think he's healthy. Um I think he's one of the best too. So they do such a great job in the run game of creating different angles. Uh, the keys defensively reading and seeing, you know, where they're trying to go with the football is going to be paramount. Yeah. And last one on, on their offense, Sean, you know, you mentioned their formations and their motion. Well, it's their unique personnel that allows them to do that. Right. Kittle can be an inline tight end. You can line them up in the slot. You can line them up out wide. You mentioned Kyle use He's probably the most dynamic fullback in, in football you can line yeah. him up in the back but you line him up outside oh wait a second is McCaffrey a running back or is McCaffrey a wide receiver on this right. play oh wait is Debo Samuel a wide receiver or is he a running back on this play they have yes. so many guys they can move around that it's impossible to kind of figure out their tendencies because their formation can look completely different with not just where guys are but personnel but the play could be the same I mean, just the 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 type of variety in, in everything that can, that they can do can just really put the defense in a bad spot. Yeah, no doubt about it. And I'm just talking about the Giants being in nickel coverage. Well, if all of a sudden they go out and they they have George Kittle and Christian McCaffrey and three wide receivers out there, well, Giants might be in dime personnel. They may send out an, an extra defensive yeah. back, and now they have one linebacker on the field. So it's four down linemen, one linebacker, and six DBs. And then they put Kittle and – Debo Samuel and McCaffrey all within, you know, the backfield in some way, shape or form. And now they're running power football at you. Um, so the, the ability to spread you out with those, with that personnel, and then also 
do power football, they could have Debo in the backfield as a running back. So uh, it's definitely something that the Giants are going to have to figure out pre-snap. Giants Auto Podcast is brought to you by Citizens, the official bank of the Giants. From game day to every day, Citizens is made ready for Giant fans with insights, guidance, and solutions. Learn more at citizensbank.com. Sean, you mentioned it off the top. Saquon Barkley, I mean, unless some type of miracle happens in the next 48 hours, he's not going to play on Thursday night. The Giants might have already um, ruled him out officially by the time people are watching or listening to this. So what's the approach now offensively for the giants? Do they stick with the same approach when you just slide in Matt Breda and, and Eric gray, who I think both guys will have a role in this game. Uh, do you go a different way? You know, how do you adjust what you're doing offensively without Saquon there? You know, I think, I don't think they're going to change too much. Um, you know, I think there were probably some plays where you would have Saquon split out as a receiver, or you would have him in the backfield and you would have certain plays where you're trying to get him um, out as a receiver and try to get him one-on-one with a linebacker. Um, so maybe they don't ha- run those specific plays. Um, but I think Matt Breida is a very good, capable running back. He's very good at hitting the hole and pressing the hole. He loves to hit the ball front side. Like he's a slasher. So he'll press the ball, press the ball, and then all of a sudden slash and cut back. But he does a great job setting that up. So uh, I'm really excited to see him and to see him get downhill. I think he's going to be um, you know, very effective for the Giants. I think the key with him is just get him as many carries early on as you can, like get him comfortable, get him into some sort of rhythm. And then really Eric Gray is going to be coming in and and playing some snaps. I think the biggest thing is going to be, who do you have out there on third down? Eric Gray in preseason, they took advantage of him a couple of times in some of the games in his pass protection. There was a couple of times where he struggled against a linebacker blitz. Um, He got run over with powers. So I know it's something he's been working on in practice. He's gotten better at it. That will be something that I am sure they're going to challenge. Now, uh, Fred Warner, uh, you know, he's the best linebacker, middle linebacker in the league right now. Um, I think he's he's not a, a full-time blitzer. Um, he did get a really nice sack um, the, the other day on a blitz. Kind of a, He started out on the left side and kind of looped around to the right. So you kind of have to – you always have to know where he is. But um, I think the, the thing that will be interesting is – I know that there were some special plays for Saquon where he was lined up direct snap. You know, we saw it last year. Hey, he's playing quarterback, faking the handoff, keeping it, running it. Um, You know, we've seen him throw the ball. Like all those plays are probably out. So uh, now if you had some gadget plays, um, some must win plays, fourth down plays, maybe you have some of those packages that were built around Saquon. Now you don't have those um, at your disposal. So you may have to come up with some other wrinkles. You love turf. You're good at it. So you start a turf biz. Business grows. Your savings grow. Become the most celebrated name in turf. Are you ready for all that life brings? Yeah, we saw in the second half against Arizona, they went to kind of that big play passing game down the field, Sean. And you mentioned this in your first answer. The only reason they were able to do that is because the offensive line was able to protect, right? Jalen Hyatt's second catch was a post corner. Well, guess what? That takes three or four seconds to open up. One of Waller's big catches, he ran a little like post stop, then went outside. That takes three or four seconds to do. Those aren't three-step drops. Those are five-step drops. And again, not taking any of the way from Arizona, but the San Francisco pass rush is a different animal than the Cardinal pass rush, right? So do you expect them to go to more of a quick game thing against this Arizona, against the San Francisco pass rush? How do you think they try to handle that part of it? Yeah, great question. I, I mean, I, I feel like this is Dallas all over again. And, yeah, it is. You, know, you can try to do that. And and look, I think the third play of the game against Dallas was a screenplay to Saquon because we're trying to slow down Micah Parsons. And um, there were a bunch of times where we they ran right at Micah Parsons. They pulled the guard, tried to block him, tried to kick him out. You're trying to get a guy like Nick Bosa to kind of look at different things like, hey, I'm unblocked right away, but oh, there's a pulling guard or, hey, I've got a fullback. You know, the wham play is a way that you can kind of get those guys to hesitate. So anything you can do to slow them down, draw screens certainly helps. But I think when you look at those big plays that you mentioned against Arizona, those are the same exact plays they ran against Dallas. And there were guys open. Darius Slayton was open against Dallas. The difference was Daniel Jones didn't have the protection. As soon as he dropped back there and put his bright foot in the ground and started to step up, there was somebody in his face so definitely credit the offensive line. I also, on play action like that, you have to give credit to the tight ends because, um, you know, there was a play against Dallas where Daniel had somebody open on it for a big chunk play and Daniel Bellinger got beat and he didn't hold up. 
This time against Arizona, we saw that protection hold up, and we saw what Daniel Jones can do. So there are some really good plays designed. Uh, Mike Kafka has carved out some nice plays to get some of those big plays. We had four plays over 25 yards against Arizona. I can't remember the last time the Giants did that in a game. So um, big passing uh, chunk plays like that are definitely something that come from running the football as well. So you kind of have to establish that first to slow everything down to get those big chunk plays. Yeah, and look, Nick Bosa has lined up, Sean, basically evenly on the right side and on the left side. They will move him around, and he's not their only pass rusher, too. Look, they have good interior pass rush. You mentioned they like the blitz, and then they play a lot of zone, right? They kind of play that old cover three going into cover four type of stuff, and Warner kind of runs the middle of the field in that zone coverage. So how do you attack that type of zone when that's going to be what you see for a lot of this game? They don't have, you know, they have a big uh, safety, Talanoa Hufanga, right? Uh, He's got a bunch of takeaways, but they don't have like these top cover corners that, you know, there's no Stephon Gilmore and Trayvon Diggs there, you know? I think if you look at the 49ers over the last couple of years, the one weakness they would say was corner. Like they had had young corners. um, So I think... You know, if you if you're looking at that as, hey, how do we take advantage of that? Start out with some quick throws, you know, get the ball out to your receiver right now. Maybe he can make those guys miss, force those guys to tackle. And if you can do that, get one guy to miss. That's a big play. Um, I think the other thing is take a couple of deep shots. You know, the tough thing with zone is if they can get pressure with four guys, it really makes it tough for the quarterback to hold on to the ball, to let those guys clear and find those soft spots to sit down in. You know, if it's man coverage, you know, the ball can come out a lot quicker because you're just throwing to a spot um, and you can kind of, you know, hedge your bet on, you know, who's got the better matchup. Um, I, I think from a zone standpoint, though, if we're playing a defense that plays a lot of zone and if they're playing a lot of too high, they're begging us to run the football. So if you see that too high safety look, there's got to be the ability to, hey, run the ball and, and you've got to be able to do that. Um, and they when they start rotating that safety down in the box, then now you can take your shots um, and try to attack downhill. But um, yeah, I think Javon Hargrave is a guy we haven't really mentioned. They signed him to a big deal from Philly. So we know him very well. Interior, he's one of the best pass rushers and he, he's got some real shiftiness, some real quickness to him. So, you know, we'll, it'll be interesting to see who's starting at right guard. If McKeithen gets his second start, if they put Glowinski back in there, Glowinski really struggled against Dallas. So I think that's why you saw McKeithen in there. Um, that, that'll be an interesting matchup to watch as well. Yeah, and if Andrew Thomas goes, as Zudu could kick into left guard then with Ben Bredesen dealing with that concussion off of that game on Sunday. So all stuff to keep an eye on, Sean. This is always fun, my friend. Look forward to seeing you in person next week. After Thursday, enjoy your weekend, I guess, off of Giants football. I'm sure you're doing NFL Network stuff. But uh, the good thing about the short week heading into Thursday, which is brutal, you have the very long week heading into the next game, which isn't until the following Monday night. So there'll be a, a long break for us there at least. Yeah, like a mini buy, they call it. Um, that, uh, hopefully, the Giants will be two and one. And um, listen, I, I hope you have a, a long hike plan with Paul Dottino today. Um, no, I have actually been staying as far away from that man as humanly possible. Giant fans love a winner. It's why they love Citizens. They're the 2022 best bank in the U.S. by the banker as the official bank of the Giants and sponsor of the huddle. Citizens is made ready for fans of Big Blue. Learn more at citizensbank.com. For, for Sean O'Hara, not Paul Dottino. I am John Schmelk. We'll see you next time on the Giants Huddle Podcast. 